that when we behold with unveiled face the glory of the Lord in a mirror, i.e. we're looking at Christ in us through the written word of God and meditating upon that, when we do that by faith and confess that, then the Holy Spirit, we are then being transformed from glory to glory into the same image from glory to glory. So we be, with the Holy Spirit, just as by the, Holy, the Spirit of the Lord. So what the Holy Spirit does is He then begins to supernaturally start to transform the Christian every single day from glory to glory, even into the image of His glory. Why is that? Because the, that's, that image is us. It's not us. It's Christ in us. And we've put on Christ. And so we should only see Christ. Now when we do that, and we believe it, and we confess it, now the Holy Spirit does the supernatural. And He actually begins to transform our lives. And so every Christian, day by day, should become more like Christ. Yeah. If we're not more like Christ today than we were yesterday, well then we've missed it in the, over the last 24 hours because the Holy Spirit is given to us to do exactly that, to transform us from glory to glory. And so how does that happen? We'll go back to Moses. He had to spend 80 days in the presence of God in order for his physical body to be so transformed that no one could look at him anymore. He had to put the veil over his face. And so we're going to have to do the same. In order for God to be able to transform us, we're going to have to spend time in front of the mirror you get a lot of people who are quite vain uh, in this life and like to spend time in front of the mirror and look at themselves. Um, but we're not looking at ourselves in the natural mirror. We're looking at ourselves in a spiritual mirror, the mirror of God's Word. And that's what we need to be focusing on and allowing the Spirit of the Lord to then do His work by transforming us from glory to glory, even into the image of His glory, Christ Jesus our Lord. An interesting passage of scripture is in Acts chapter 11 verse 25 and 26. The scripture says, Then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So, this is an interesting passage. Why were this, the disciples first called Christians in Antioch? Well, the reason is very simple. It happened after Paul got there. Paul had been teaching in Tarsus. Um, if you know Paul's timeline, basically, he, uh, just quickly run down through it. He gets born again on the road to Damascus. He then uh, goes into Arabia, spends roughly just short of three years in Arabia, God gives him revelation of the gospel. He comes back to Damascus, he preaches the gospel there, not for a very long period of time, a couple of weeks, and they try to kill him. So he has to escape. He escapes to Jerusalem. He joins the disciples there. He's there for not longer than two weeks, and the Jews try to kill him there. And so what happens is then the Jews, the Jewish believers, send him off to Tarsus in Cilicia, um, we, you know, you get, we don't hear about Paul again for about, ooh, I'm just getting my timeline right here. Could be over 10 years we don't hear about Paul again. Now what happens is Barnabas, uh, is, is, he's in the church at Antioch, the church at Jerusalem had sent Barnabas down there because they'd heard that, you know, that church was growing. He gets down there and the Holy Spirit impresses upon Barnabas, go find Paul and bring him down here. Well, he was a stall, was still Saul at that time. He brings Saul down there, and then Saul and Barnabas, with other ministers of the gospel, uh, teach the church at Antioch for a whole year. It is after Paul gets down there, well, his name was Saul still at the time, but it's after he gets down there that this comment is made. The disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now, why is that? It's because the, the apostle Paul, at this time, Saul is still a prophet, he's not an apostle yet, and only a few years later that God promotes him into the office of apostle, him and Barnabas. But he understands the gospel message of Christianity. From the point of view, it wasn't called Christianity at the time, but he understood the, the gospel mystery of Christ in you, the hope of glory. The apostle Peter, because uh, of the apostles we have who wrote, and we have the, the, the New Testament, we have Paul's writings, we have Peter, we have John, we have James, we have Jude, those four. 
Paul, Peter, James, John, Jude, five, sorry. <laughs> Those five. Now of the of the five, it is really only Peter who mentions Christ in us. I think he mentions it three times, roughly. The Apostle Paul, in his writings to the churches, I'll get, I might get a bit wrong, I think he mentions it over 80 times, eight zero times. Now, why is Paul so um, emphatic about this aspect? Because he calls it a mystery. This is the mystery of the gospel. He refers it uh, as, to it as the mystery of the gospel. It's because he understands the concept. He understands that this Christian walk is, in fact, Christ in us, the hope of glory living through us. It's a supernatural walk. And so he teaches this truth very strongly in his writings. Now, when he gets to the church at Antioch and he starts to teach them, the penny drops. And they begin to realize, okay, what Paul is actually teaching us is that we're little Christs. Because it's no longer we who live, it's Christ in us, the hope of glory. It's Christ living through us. So what that actually means is that we're all little Christs, and thus the term Christian comes about. Because the word term Christian means little Christ. And so that's where this terminology came from. And it's a terminology that is used, uh, Peter talks about if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. And so the Holy Spirit uh, recognizes the term. Why? Because it's, it's this doctrine of being baptized into Christ, being fully immersed in Christ, and Christ can be taken over, basically. We, we become clothed with Christ. The scripture we read earlier says, we have put on Christ. And so, it's such an important truth for Christians to understand, because this is the born again experience. It's not just the fact that we have now been saved and we're destined for heaven, we've skipped out on hell. It's meant to be a transformative process from there on out. We, the Bible in the book of Romans says that we, God has predestined us to be conformed into the image of His Son. Now that is going to take place, obviously, when uh, our Lord Jesus Christ returns. But prior to that, we're meant to be transformed from glory to glory. Think about Moses again, 80 days in the presence of God, and physically his body is transformed. So much so that when he dies, there's a dispute that arises between Satan and Michael because God says to Michael, go bury Moses' body. The reason for that was is that Moses' body couldn't decay anymore because it had been exposed to the glory of God. And so Satan wants that body because he knows that that is really a body that uh, he can use in the earth. And uh, so there was the dis dispute that took place and Michael won the argument and Michael got to bury Moses' body. No one knows where it is to this day except God himself. Um, Moses will get his body back one day. But that is what happened in the natural when Moses was exposed to the glory under the old covenant. And, Peter, and Paul says, guys, how much more should we be transformed because of the glory that is in us under the new covenant? And so if we're going to get that transformation to take place, we're going to have to do what Moses did. We're going to have to look at that image in that mirror on a regular basis and allow the Holy Spirit to transform us from glory to glory. So, we just need to get our minds around this Christian walk. It's completely different. It's not like any other religion out there that has to obey a set of rules and has to you know, do certain things. The Christ Christianity is transformative in nature, and it's not something that we can do to do the transformation. It's the power of the Spirit of God who does that. But we have to, um, oh, what I'm looking for? We have to cooperate with him by faith in order for him to do that. And we do that by looking into the mirror of his word and believing that he's going to that he does transform us. Romans six three to eight says, "Or well, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death?" Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. We need to understand also that when we are born again, one of the things that transpires is that the old man dies. And so we are baptized into the death of Christ. And so our, our whole concept of life should start to change. We need to, because a lot of Christians, they are born again, 
um, they're destined for heaven, but they still live as if they're in this world. This world is still very, very important to them. The things in this life are very important to them. But as we allow God to transform us into the image of His Son, what happens is heaven's priorities start becoming more real to us and earth's priorities start falling away, drifting away. Because as far as heaven's concerned, Christ is concerned, His agenda is all in all. Christ is not really into this earth's agenda at all. Obviously He's not. And so we need to allow Christ in us, the hope of glory, to be made manifest through us. And so we just need to understand the concept that once we're in this kingdom, that this world no longer should have any hold on us from the point of view of it attracting our attention. Our attention should always be attracted by heaven. Um, we, we should always be focused on Christ in us and on heaven above in walking even as Christ walked. And so, as I mentioned at the outset, it is in fact the Holy Spirit Himself who baptizes us into Christ when we are born again. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. And so it's where a lot of Christians miss it with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They say, yeah, I've already been baptized in, uh, uh, into Christ. It's one spirit, um, and I'll be made to drink one spirit already. And that's true. But the, the Bible talks about the fact that the Spirit is the, the Lord is the Spirit, talking about our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit are all one, yet they are separate individuals in their own right. But nevertheless, they are one. And so from the point of view of the three baptisms, we can kind of get the concept right if we look at the Godhead. You may have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are one, but they are three separate individuals. Um, and so the, water, the baptism, the three separate baptisms, although they are separate baptisms, is really just the one baptism. I mean, they were baptized into Christ. But we have to still experience the other two. And so it is the Holy Spirit, for it says, for by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Which body is that? The body of Christ. So it's the Holy Spirit who takes us and immerses us into the body of Christ. Romans 8, 14 to 16 says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirits that we are children of God. Verse 16. And so when we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit of God, we are then obviously immersed into the Spirit. We have been made to all to drink into one Spirit. And so we partake of the Holy Spirit at that time. You recall our Lord Jesus Christ when He appeared to the disciples in the upper room, we think it's the upper room, but it was in a closed room that night, on the first night that He was raised from the dead. He breathed on them and He said, Receive the Holy Spirit. But later, our Lord then spoke about them being baptized in the Holy Spirit. So it was a subsequent experience. But nevertheless, the Holy Spirit then entered into them. When our Lord was on the earth, He said, The Holy Spirit is with you, but He will be in you. And so once we're born again, the Holy Spirit can now take up residence on the inside of the born again believer because their spirits are now perfect and now in the perfect environment for the Holy Spirit to dwell in. That's why He couldn't live inside the spirits of the of the. Old Testament saints, because their spirits weren't born again. And so the Holy Spirit takes up residence on the inside of us. Now, when He comes to dwell within us, there's a, a number of things, a lot of things, a myriad of things that He does for us. Now, one of the things that He does for us is He leads us and He guides us in their phase of life. Because the Scripture says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So every son of God, daughter as well, obviously, uh, can expect to be led by the Spirit of God. It's a right given to us by God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So that's one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us when we come into His kingdom, that kingdom of God, is that He leads us in the affairs of life. But one of the other things He does is that He bears witness with our spirits. We are children of God. And so every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of them witnessing with their spirits that they're children of God. And so no Christian should ever doubt their salvation. Why is that? Because they've got the witness in their spirits, by the Holy Spirit Himself, that they're children of God. 
And so when Christians do begin to doubt their salvation, you can be very sure that they are walking more in the flesh than in the spirit because they are looking at the outward and not looking at the inward. Because inside, it's in our spirits that the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirits that we're children of God. And so as we, again, with unveiled face, beholding the image of God, the glory of God that is within us, that we then begin to reflect the glory of God. We, we have a, a, a sure knowing in ourselves that we are children of God. There are other things that the Holy Spirit have been, has been sent to do for us um, because we've been baptized into Christ. John 16, 13, our Lord says, However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak under His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak. And He will tell you things to come. So a couple of things here that the Holy Spirit does for us is that He teaches us the Word of God. He guides us into all truth. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't need to hear teachings given to us by uh, teachers that the Lord raises up in His church, because even those whom the Lord raises up as teachers in the church, although it's a man who's doing the teaching, it is the Spirit of God teaching through that man. And so in the same manner, we're receiving that teaching from the Holy Spirit through the vessel. It's just the vessel that's doing the talking, but it's the Holy Spirit who is initiating the words spoken. And so one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is He teaches us, He leads us and guides us into all the truth of God's Word. He also shows us things to come, and so He does in our own lives, show us things that will take place in our lives, so that we can have, um, be prepared for what's coming in our lives, and you know, there's a whole lot of aspects to this Christian faith, but all of it is supernatural. Look at what our Lord said about the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of us, because a lot of Christians struggle in this area, they, 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 the, the comment is, I've got the Holy Spirit inside me. So what is this thing that I've still got to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? That doesn't make sense. Um, it's because we, we need to understand that it's the same Spirit, but a deeper dimension thereof. Uh, let me try and explain it in the gifts of the Spirit. One who has the gift of prophecy, and, a, and one who has a, a, the gift of, of a prophet, in other words, they're called as a prophet, uh, full-time ministry. They both prophesy but the prophet will prophesy in a greater dimension than the, the layman who has the simple gift of prophecy. And so every born again believer has the Spirit of God residing on the inside of them. But to be baptized in the Spirit, and we'll get into that as we get into the series, is a deeper dimension of the same Spirit. So it's not a different Holy Spirit, same Holy Spirit, just a deeper dimension, a, um, a more, more of the Holy Spirit, so to speak. Look at what our Lord said about the Holy Spirit living inside every single born-again believer. So every born-again believer has the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of the Spirit. You cannot be born again and not have the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of you. Um, why? Because it's the Holy Spirit who immerses us into Christ. John 4, 13 and 14, the Scripture says, Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life. Now that water that our Lord is referring to is the water of the Holy Spirit. He comes to dwell within us and he becomes a fountain of water, springing up into everlasting life inside of the spirit of the born again believer. Now a fountain is really there to bless the believer. Um, because don't forget, we're talking about uh, when we're transformed, it really blesses us. Now, the, the individuals around us are blessed because we start to behave more like Christ. And so they get to be re um, recipients of that behavior. But the blessing is really inside the believer because the believer is starting to become more like Christ. So that's what the, uh, the, a fountain is. It's, it's for our own thirst. So we never thirst. Why is that? Because we have this, this fountain that's well enough in, in eternal life in us all the time. And we just keep drinking of that water. It just never goes away because it's eternal. That's the blessing. Now, we'll look at it when we look at the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Lord spoke in, in another passage of Scripture about rivers of living water flowing from the believer. Now, that's talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It actually does refer to uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit in that passage. And so that now, what has happened, rivers flowing out from the believer now blesses those around them. But a fountain blesses the individual. 
And so every Christian has the Holy Spirit residing on the inside of them, a fountain of living water that, that we should never thirst. I'm talking spiritually now. Why? Because we have this eternal fountain within us all the time. And we have been immersed into Christ. And so that's what the first baptism is all about. And so we looked at, at in today's teaching, we, looked, we touched on the introduction from the point of view of this doctrine of baptisms is one of the six foundational doctrines to the Christian faith. And then we had a look at the fact that there are in fact three separate baptisms taught in the New Testament. The doctrine is doctrine of baptisms, plural. And the first one is baptized into Christ, second is water, third is baptized into the Holy Spirit. We saw the concept of being baptized means to be fully immersed in two, and we've seen that we have been fully immersed. It is the Holy Spirit who baptizes us into Christ. So we've been fully immersed into Christ, we've put on Christ. Um, and so that is the concept of being baptized into Christ, which I say every single believer partakes of. The other two, <coughs> which we'll go through in the next teaching, uh, and the one after that, not every Christian does partake of those baptisms. This one is essential. This is eternal life. We do not partake of this one. We're not born again. We're not born again. We're destined for hell. And so every believer partakes of this baptism. I'm going to end the teaching that one.